but let me just start by introducing, I'm very happy to introduce to you Professor Howlin. Professor Howlin is working in the Institute of Psychiatry in King's College in London and she's well known for her outstanding work and long work on children and adolescents and both adults um, with autism spectrum disorders. Um, she did a lot of work and investigated um, an, a variety of children in a broad age range, both um, adult studies and outcome studies, developmental pathways and treatment effects later in life, but also, and I think that was more recently, uh, very, very young children with autism spectrum disorders and the uh, effect of treatment on the development of these children. And that is what you want to talk about today. Let me introduce to you Patricia Houghton. Um, thank you very much and um, thank you for coming so early this morning. I think 8.30 is not an hour that I usually either give or attend lectures and also of course there's two uh, state-of-the-art lectures on autism at the same time which is uh, um, so it's difficult to make choices as well. Um, but what I was going to do this morning was just look at the, uh, the evidence base really for various, uh, mainly behavioural and some cognitive therapies for, for children with autism spectrum disorders um, and um, what um, sort of steps we need to take to, to improve interventions for uh, this uh, group of children and their families. Um, but I thought, first of all, like um, Philip Graham yesterday, I'd just give a little um, history of interventions for autism. And, of course, probably one of the, the first accounts of um, a behavioural approach used with a uh, child with autism was Itar's uh, study of the, the wild boy of Aviron, um, who showed very um, typical um, autistic uh, symptoms. And Itai used a, a, a systematic and very detailed educational program to try and uh, develop the boy's skills, um, also teaching him sign language, uh, although there was um, a, a lot of punitive aspects to the therapy as well as uh, reward aspects. So that's probably one of the first examples. Um, but actually, for probably a good century and a half after that, um, people with autism were generally treated in institutions for what was called mentally defective or, or the insane. And then, um, as Philip Graham again was talking about yesterday, around the 1940s, 50s, um, psychotherapeutic analytic um, interventions started um, being used, both with, children, both with the children with autism uh, and also their parents, because it was considered at that time that it was probably aspects of the, the parents' um, less than optimal child rearing that was giving um, rise to, to difficulties with the, uh, with the children. Um, also at that time, one reads accounts of uh, um, drugs and also even treatments like uh, electroconvulsive therapy that were being used with schizophrenia at the time, starting to be used for children with autism as well. Um, because when Kanner first described autism, he felt very strongly um, that autism was probably an early form of schizophrenia uh, and therefore the types of treatments that worked with, with that condition would also work in autism. And then really moving on through the um, 60s, one uh, sees autism being viewed and, as, and treated as a uh, behavioural disorder um, with um, behavioural interventions beginning mostly in inpatient hospital basis um, so parents not really being involved much in treatment at all. Um, there were uh, communication training programs, but these focused very much on teaching children to speak, to use words, not really looking at the communicative intent or the broader aspects of communication there, and rather rigid systems of reward and punishment. So it's very much if a child was good, you'd give them a sweet, so sweets being the, a very typical form of reward without looking at uh, doing a, a functional analysis of whether that was the sort of appropriate reward for children. 
And of course, for more difficult behaviours like this, really quite punitive uh, um, responses, sometimes even uh, uh, children being um, given electric shock, so the use of cattle prods being reported in some of the earlier studies. Um, so, um, although in, in some ways th those years were useful, showing that behavioural interventions could be very helpful for children with autism, the nature of those interventions was not particularly um, were well thought out. Um, but later on, um, the, there was a move towards the uh, certainly recognition of the need for early interventions for children uh, and individually based programs rather than this rather rigid behavioural approach that had been typical beforehand. Um, and also a focus on the involvement of parents, a focus on the involvement of, of schools as well. And looking at uh, still a focus on communication but looking at much broader aspects of communication, not just imitating sounds. And then there's also been uh, attempts to use uh, peers or siblings in therapy, um, and some attempts to improve more fundamental deficits, such as social understanding and so forth. So a lot of changes in approaches to therapy over the years, um, and also, of course, changes in, in knowledge uh, about autism. So recognition that autism spectrum disorders are highly heritable, um, that they're probably the, the most fundamental deficits lie in social communication skills, but probably most importantly, um, the um, findings that uh, these are not rare conditions and uh, recent studies such as that of Gilly Baird and Tony Charman and colleagues, for example, indicating that they may affect up to as many as 1% of the uh, population. Um, and this, of course, is a sort of uh, tracking the estimates of prevalence uh, over the years, going from very uh, small, uh, 4 or 5 per 10,000 being the figures quoted in the 70s, then to around 30 per 10,000, 60. Um, some years ago, the National Autistic Society in Lorna Wing in the UK suggested the rates were around 90 per 10,000, which was treated with some scepticism by um, a number of groups, but in fact, the, the study by Gillian Baird and colleagues showing rates of, um, well, the, within confidence intervals being fairly wide, of around um, 100 per 10,000. So, um, you don't have to be a mathematician to work out that's around 1% of the population. Now, of course, some people have suggested uh, there's been talks of a, an epidemic of autism with suggestions that this may be caused by all sorts of things from, from vaccines to environmental toxins and so forth. Um, but in fact, I think the, there's no good evidence that the numbers of children being born with autism have increased substantially. But of course, recognition is much better. And training professionals to um, diagnose children with autism has made a big difference. And this recent study by Wazana et al., just showing that uh, it's a statistical modelling um, study, showing that if you um, add in the uh, factors such as the uh, widening the age at which diagnosis is made, uh, widen, um, the focus on tighter diagnostic criteria and so forth, you actually, uh, you, using statistical modelling, will see a rise like that in the numbers diagnosed without there being a substantial increase or any increase in the numbers of um, children being born. Another um, important finding <coughs> from... <coughs> Sorry, I need to get the water. Thank you. Um, another, another finding from recent studies is the uh, notion that, in, in fact... Oh, thanks, I couldn't see it. Um, rather than being m mostly associated with severe learning disabilities, it may be, in fact, that a majority of children with autism actually have an IQ over 70, and there's a number of studies showing that. So with ratios of around 60% being within the normal IQ range um, and around 40% being more severely affected cognitively. Um, and also, um, studies by Catherine Lord and her colleagues over long-term long, 
investigations showing that actually the, many, many children do develop uh, good language over time. So they may be very delayed in their language initially, but many go on to develop language. And I think these findings uh, clearly have uh, massive implications for educational and social and, and health services. Um, they also, I think, have uh, uh, applications for, for health services for elderly, for older adults, although that's an area that really has not been explored at all. But, of course, this rise in diagnosis, the numbers of children out there who have been given the diagnosis, and the numbers of relatively high-functioning children being identified as well, um, has also offered massive opportunities for people offering therapy, and not necessarily always good therapies either. So if one looks in the, in, in the internet um, or you know, sometimes in the media, you see all sorts of therapies being claimed to do wonders for children with autism, with words like miracle um, being uh, uh, thrown around. So uh, these are the sorts of physical sensory therapies that you may read about, everything from uh, cranial osteopathy to listening to tapes of filtered sound, to swimming with dolphins or being spun round in nets, wearing special spectacles, a whole range of therapies there. Um, various psychoeducational therapies from facilitated communication to the, the Sunrise Options Program, uh, the uh, Floor Time Program of Greenspan, special schooling, all of these uh, or many of them anyway, having very good and sensible aspects to uh, the components of therapy, but the problems being made in, in the claims uh, that are put forward to parents that these will cure the child or may help them recover from autism. So it's not the therapies themselves so much often, but the claims that are made. And then, of course, there's various uh, pharmacological therapies from vitamin supplements to uh, various medications, diets. Um, this is a recent one where, where children are put into oxygen tents and that's supposed to um, help them um, recover some brain function that's supposedly lost. And people paying very large amounts of money for therapies that sometimes seem to be uh, you know, more like... Um, magic than anything else. So, for example, um, salt, salt crystal lamps are supposed to draw out the, the evil uh, substances or the noxious substances that are in the children's bodies, um, and that will help them recover from autism. So all these sorts of claims that are out there for parents, and of course it's very difficult for them to work out what they should use and what they shouldn't. And even families, families with medical backgrounds, for example, would say that they know um, in their, their head, they know logically that these therapies cannot possibly do what they say they're going to do. But still, in their hearts, there's this little feeling, well, just what if? What if this was the one thing that was going to work and we don't do it? And that will sort of, you know, have affected our lives and the lives of the child forever. Um, so uh, parents are a very vulnerable group and if one looks at their use of alternative therapies it is very, uh, very wide. So this fairly recent study, for example, of 112 families showed actually around three quarters had tried or were trying various alternative or complementary therapies. So sensory therapies, drugs, biological therapies, spiritual type of therapies or physical manipulation, um, e even acupuncture. So very many of them uh, trying or at least have had a go at one of, or other of these sorts of therapies and often parents have tried several. Um, and another study also illustrating the use of these alternative therapies um, just comparing to parents of children with autism with parents of children with, with really severe physical conditions, physical illnesses. And you can see here that um, parents of the children with autism much more likely to try biological type of therapies, injections, diets and so forth. They were more likely to try sensory types of therapies or 
uh, or spiritual ones. And, and again, in this group, the figures differ from study to study depending on quite how they're done. But again, in this group, over half, around half using some alternative therapy compared with a much lower proportion of the parents of children with severe physical problems. And of course, when parents have spent a lot of time and money seeking out these therapies, they do tend to report um, satisfaction. They say they're glad they did it in many cases and that they feel it helped their child. But it really, feelings is all there is because there's very little evidence for any of these alternative type therapies. So very little in the way of evidence-based the claims just based on anecdotal accounts because, of course, therapists won't tell the parents about um, cases where the therapy has failed. They only publicise the cases where the therapy has worked well. Um, and really, on the basis of the evidence, or lack of it at the moment, it's very, very difficult to advise parents whether they should or should not take up some of these therapies. And there's um, been a, a number of reviews now of the adequacy of, of various therapies for young children with autism. Um, probably the first one was this um, review by the New York Health Department looking at interventions for children under six. And they um, identified um, several hundred therapies for, for preschool children with autism the largest being in the behavioural educational um, approaches. But you can see large numbers of therapies, but actually in terms of the percentage meeting, even very basic um, experimental criteria, uh, the proportion being very low. So really quite poor quality research on the whole. Um, and that's been, um, th th those sorts of findings have been identified in, in, in uh, more recent reviews, from uh, another one from, from MADSAC in Maine, uh, Australian reviews, a New Zealand review, and a more recent one in, in Scotland. Um, so um, just pointing out that the, even when the, there are uh, publications emerge from these therapies, uh, the standard of, of research is poor. There's been some attempts to try and identify the most um, effective components of therapy, and uh, one very important factor seems to be the involvement of parents. So therapies that just take the child away um, and send him swimming with dolphins or cranial osteopathy or something uh, don't tend to have any longer-term effects, although children may well like swimming with the dolphins, uh, it's not going to cure their autism. Um, and one, there's, I did have one child who went to uh, swim with dolphins and he bit the dolphin, so uh, that didn't go down very well. And there is now actually a movement in California suggesting that this is that the use of dolphins in this way, not just for children with autism but other conditions, is, is abusive of dolphins, so it should be uh, stopped altogether. Um, but anyway, uh, it's involving parents in therapy that's important, using some form of a fairly intensive behavioural intervention, but actually bringing in other components of education as well, so um, psychoeducational approaches. And then um, the last factor really being that um, the, it's the duration of therapy that's also important, that therapies that last, say, 10 sessions or something like that at two weeks are not likely to have any long-term impact on children's lives. Looking at the uh, evidence generally, it's clear that the most impressive results are for early intensive behavioural intervention. This is a programme that started at the University of California in Los Angeles, um, begun by Ivar Lovas and his colleagues. Levo Lovas was very instrumental in the 60s in showing uh, how effective um, operant behavioural approaches could be for children with autism. And he also um, pointed out the importance of working with, with families. But as time went on, he's packaged this up into a much more intensive program um, with uh, the intervention starting at the age of two years, lasting, um, lasting for around two years. Um, and the, probably the significant factor is being a, a 
the intensive therapy being 40 hours a week, so massive demands on parents there. But uh, the early um, publication on this study showed that uh, there was a significant increase in IQ in the children who'd been through the program, and Lovas claiming that um, 40% of the cases following therapy were indistinguishable from their normal peers. And of course, 40% sounds um, fantastic, much better than the rates for um, any other program. The problem is that there are only 19 children in the group, so 40% of 19 is actually only 9 children. So those 9 children clearly did very well. Um, but I think that's not enough on which to um, base uh, claims that this sort of therapy is right for all children. Um, and sometimes when comparisons have been done, uh, the comparative treatment has not been of a particularly high standard. Um, and, for example, we carried out a, a study that's actually just been published, um, relatively small groups, as with all, all these studies individually, um, but two groups of children um, at around um, just over, uh, just around three, three and a half years of age, um, matched for um, mental age and language and violence scores and so forth. And uh, going through um, early intensive programs. And certainly, sorry, this is a bit small, but certainly the children in the, intensi the early intensive behavioural program showed significant changes in many areas of functioning. So mental age increased, their um, language and violence scores increased. And the one line that you may be able to see that's sort of coming down a little is actually their scores on the uh, autism diagnostic interview. So the uh, severity of autistic symptomatology decreased as well. But we, comp we compared those results with children who at the same time um, started in highly specialist uh, nurseries specifically for children with autism. So very well trained staff, a lot of knowledge and expertise in autism. And in fact, in using that comparison group, there was very little difference between the, the two cohorts. Certainly after two years, which is when we first followed them up. There was a small difference in uh, Vineland scores, although it lacked significance when one controlled for IQ. Um, and certainly at two years following therapy, there were no children unsupported in mainstream school in either the um, early behavioural intervention or the specialist nursery group. Um, we're now following up children again after seven years, so now they're about 9, 10 or 11 years of age, just to see whether, um, in fact, the, the early intensive group are now at an advantage or whether the uh, very small differences between them at two years uh, have uh, remained or disappeared. Um, another very important finding, um, not just because from this uh, study, but also all the studies of behavioural interventions one looks at, is the huge range of, of uh, the huge variability of children's responses. So these are just group figures, and really they cover up the huge differences in individual children. So, for example, the, if you look here, the, the Blue bars are um, children who made very little change. The black bars are children who made huge changes. Um, and the red ones are children who made moderate uh, improvements. And you can see there are actually very few children who make very significant gains. There are some who make big changes in symptomatology, in their, um, their IQ, and to some ex lesser extent in language scores, and many children who make moderate changes. So this is their score. This is mental age, receptive language, expressive language, Vineland, and scores on the uh, ADI. Um, but many, there are also many children, the green bars, who show no change or who actually show a, a, a deceleration over time, and the same being found in both groups. So I think it is very important to recognise this huge variability and the fact that group means aren't enough to advise uh, parents on an individual basis what sort of therapy they should go for. 
Um, and if one looks at other studies of early intensive um, interventions as well, it actually turns out to be quite difficult to do comparisons between them. The results are quite different from study to study, um, although they all describe themselves as using these very in intensive early programs, but they differ in terms of the lengths and intensity of treatment, and also, as I say, the quality of the alternative intervention. Often the comparison intervention is uh, very low quality, low intensity. So all one can glean from those studies is that having a very good quality, high intensity program like EIBI is better than a poor quality program. It doesn't really uh, tell you whether EIBI is better than uh, other high quality programs. The, it's also the, the children differ, the measures differ. And another important factor in, in the studies is that many of the children in, what, in both the um, intensive treatment and additional groups are having these additional alternative treatments. And as I say, this focus on group measures really distinguishes large individual variation. So there's been about 11 um, well-designed, well-conducted um, studies looking at early intensive um, interventions using an applied behavioural analytic approach. Sorry. And you can see the sort of variation there. These are studies that report major changes in IQ of over 20 points across the, the group, studies um, reporting lesser changes of around 10 to 20 points, and some studies showing relatively little change. So that's the, uh, the, uh, the green bar there. So a variation in these studies, and effect sizes ranging from around 0.5 uh, to, to over one. So just again to illustrate, these are the mean um, IQ uh, ch point changes that reported in the study. So these are the 11 studies and you can see some reporting massive changes in IQ and others much smaller changes in IQ. Uh, the, the other significant finding I think is that the studies that have um, brought about the greatest IQ change in the children involved have not necessarily brought about the biggest changes in other aspects of children's uh, functioning. So if you look at this rather messy slide, the, these are, this is the uh, IQ change in those 11 studies, the magnitude of the IQ change, but you can see change in their Vineland scores tends to be much less. Uh, the changes in expressive language varies from studies. Um, and some of the studies that have the um, highest IQ change actually had the smallest change in terms of uh, language comprehension. So small sort of correlations between various measures, which again don't really help you to work out which particular programs are best for which particular children. Um, another... Um, issue that some of these studies have, have tried to address is whether there are factors that predict outcome. I think there's a widespread recognition now that the uh, children vary very much in their responses to treatment and what is it that, that predicts outcome. But again, it's really very difficult to come to any consistent findings here, partly because different studies have looked at different, um, different aspects. Um, but some studies have shown that IQ, initial IQ is the best predictor, others that initial language, particularly comprehension, is the best predictor, and then a variety of other things that have been looked at. Um, the one study showed that children with the less severe symptoms to begin with did best, but another study showing actually the children with the most severe symptoms to begin with did best out of the group. The one thing that um, the factors that haven't been shown to be um, related to outcome are the, either the length of the intervention, although all these were over a year, the intensity, although again they're all over 20 hours a week, or the, the age at which children started the intervention. So those don't seem to be particularly predictive factors. Um, and some studies just looked at a range of factors and found nothing predictive. 
Um, and they, these numbers don't add up to 11 because some of the studies looked at uh, a variety of a combination of factors. So I think there's no doubt that early intensive behavioural programmes do work very well for some children, but we're still not really able to identify beforehand which children should go into those programmes and which uh, children would pa perhaps be better served um, going into some alternative form of high quality therapy. Because these early intensive programmes aren't the only effective treatments and there's a number of randomised control trials now um, showing the importance of programmes involving communication training, early training for parents and generally um, and programmes enhancing the, the interaction um, uh, between uh, newly diagnosed children and their parents and, uh, and focusing on issues such as joint attention. So the, just to go through fairly quickly, the randomised control trials that are, have uh, been published recently, there are a number on uh, parent, teaching parents uh, just general management strategies, showing uh, parents increase significantly in their knowledge of autism, greater sense of control, and also um, gains in children's language following these programmes. The, um, one, randomized, uh, one of the randomised trials of uh, early intensive therapy by Tristan Smith, again showing significant changes in IQ um, and also in language and children subsequently less likely to be in a, in a highly um, specialised educational placement. And then a recent study by Bruce Tong in, in Australia showing um, significant uh, improvements in parental mental health um, having been uh, involved in these programmes, although the, the child data there aren't published yet. There's Connie Kasari's studies on uh, teaching um, joint attention and symbolic play to very young children, three to four years old, and uh, she not surprisingly found that children who were uh, whose and parents who were specifically trained to develop joint attention um, made more progress in joint attention and, and initiation. Um, children who were, uh, and parents who were involved in play um, interventions made more progress in those areas. And I think this study is important, showing that neither of those interventions could be said to be better than the other. They simply um, help the child and the parents develop uh, specific skills uh, in, in, that, that were specifically taught. Uh, there's uh, programs to um, enhance parental c communication with their children. Catherine Aldred's study in, in the UK, a small randomised control trial uh, that's now the, uh, the basis of a very large scale uh, multi-site uh, randomised control trial. Uh, but that early study showing significant gains in initiations by the child, in reciprocal social interaction, and also expressive language, although not so much in other areas of functioning. Um, there are programmes, of course, like PECS, the, um, the Picture Exchange Communication System, and um, a recent, uh, the couple of randomised control trials there, there's Paul Yoder's and, and one of our own, showing that the use of PECS, teaching teachers to use uh, PECS, to, to train children to use PECS appropriately, brings about um, increases in their, their use of symbols to communicate, although it doesn't actually get the children speaking. Um, and again, with the, the PEC studies showing that individual outcomes are very variable, that some children do seem to respond very well to this type of programme, but it does depend on the child's characteristics. Um, I think somewhat surprisingly, we found it tended to work best with children who were lowest functioning, who'd got the poorest intellectual ability in the group, who'd got the very, very limited communication skills, and for those children, PECs seemed to work um, particularly well. Um, it also worked well for children who showed very little initiation to begin with. PECs really helped them to develop those skills. 
Um, it also seemed to work best to, with children who showed some interest in their environment, who showed more object exploration and so forth. Um, so small group changes in that study, um, but actually for some children, individual children, pretty large changes. There are, of course, loads of other sorts of interventions around. Um, the trouble is um, they may well work and um, many people find them helpful, both for parents and particularly on an educational basis. The problem is they tend to be rather descriptive accounts, so very little in the way of good comparative studies and certainly nothing in the way of randomised control trials. So there are a whole range of uh, social skills type strategies to try and help uh, children develop more appropriate um, social ways of socially interacting, to help their social understanding, things like social scripts, various rule-based programs, teaching children self-awareness, social stories, joint attention programs, a whole range of things there. And what one finds with the... With the evidence um, for these programs sorry um, I think I've I think I've skipped over ones let me just see um, oops I'll skip that one. Um, and then, sorry, the, the evidence for, for those programmes shows they tend to work, but on the specific skills that are taught, so very little generalisation uh, to uh, other areas. Um, so little generalisation to other domains, little impact on language or um, use of, of sort of so terms of social understanding. And the same is true for programmes focusing on deficits in theory of mind as well. Uh, so that various teaching strategies there, I mean this is the original sort of um, experiments of Simon Baron Cohen showing, uh, uh, illustrating how deep these deficits go. Um, and of course there's been much more sophisticated work since. But again, although there's lots of programs around and many of them reported in the literature showing positive findings, um, the, uh, again, little generalisation to uh, untrained domains. The children uh, may seem to understand mental states a bit more, but in terms of their general daily use of language, they're not using mental state terms more and measures of generalisation also being very limited. Um, and then there's a whole range of other communication-based therapies as well. I think the one one can say doesn't work because of the whole wealth of evidence against it is facilitated communication where there's a, a facilitator um, somehow uh, prompting the child uh, to use communicating devices. Uh, but there are a range of other communication programs, early bird, um, the pain and program and so forth, uh, no randomised trials but some uh, you know, positive parental reports and the uh, recent study of the, uh, the pain and program, the more than words, showing improvements in child vocabulary and in parent communication styles. Then, of course, there's the TEACH programmes that were developed by Eric Schopler um, and which had a huge impact on, on educational for children with autism really across the world. And, and he certainly left a, an extremely important um, legacy, um, helping people to recognise that children with autism don't learn well um, through spoken means, but they do, work, they do learn very well through through visual means. Um, there, there haven't been so many um, big scale studies of, pe of TEACH, uh, but certainly uh, the reports show that um, they, the use of TEACH type programs results in significant gains in children's behaviour and in parents' feelings of being control, in control. Um, also good generalisation to, to non-treatment settings as well, which is very important. So not just changes in IQ, which have been reported, 
but uh, children who learn to work in this sort of environment being able to work and, and function better in other environments too. Um, there are other forms of augmentative communication, of course, as well. I think there's not a huge amount of evidence that teaching children with autism to use um, symbols or signs is particularly effective. They can learn to use signs, but they tend to use them in a, in a very repetitive, stereotyped, um, almost echolalic type of way. So they just repeat the same signs over and over and over. There's some more studies now on the use of electronic computer-based equipment. Again, not a huge amount of evidence there, but given the vast range of technologies that are available now to help uh, children, say, with conditions such as cerebral palsy to communicate with, uh, using very, very limited uh, physical um, abilities, that I think this gives a, um, is an opening for, certainly for more severely uh, affected children with autism with very poor communication skills. So I think that um, just to um, conclude that, that part of the talk, um, I think what you get if you look at studies across the board uh, of interventions for children with autism, um, it's that um, you tend to get a very specific response uh, to the intervention. Uh, in other words, perhaps not surprisingly, what you teach is what you get. If you teach joint attention, you get improvements in joint attention, but not necessarily in language or play. If you focus on play, you get improvements there, but not necessarily in social skills. If you teach social skills in one setting, you get improvements there, but not necessarily in other settings. So really, um, I think the message is not to expect too much from any one programme. Each type of methodology can be very helpful for children, but you, autism is such a, um, a pervasive disorder um, that you need to be um, attacking it from all fronts, really, with many different approaches if one's really going to have a major change on children's lives. And with respect to specific treatments, I think the big question there is... Um, not do they work, because clearly um, many therapies work with many different children, but it's what sorts of children they work with. Um, <coughs> and just to point, for example, the um, early intensive studies t tend to exclude children with very low IQ, so they don't necessarily work with those, and we don't know that they do. We don't really know how, what's the optimal length of treatments, the optimal intensity, um, <coughs> and so forth, uh, nor do we know the age at which therapy should ideally begin. A lot of focus on very young children, but I think there's always a concern that putting all the money into children under six um, could deprive older children of the, the interventions that they, they still badly need. So I think just to summarise within the field, these randomised control trials were a big, big step forward and over the last couple of years there's been a sudden flurry of these and there are certainly more to, to come. But still the focus on preschool studies, focus mostly on behaviour and communication or social communication, but not on other aspects of, of children's functioning, particularly uh, social emotional difficulties. Um, and I suppose one could ask, is there a need for a focus on, on these sorts of problems in autism spectrum disorders? And I think the, the answer there is certainly yes, because there's good evidence that from adolescence onwards, children with ASD have significantly higher rates of anxiety or depressive problems than do other groups of children, not just typically developing children, but children with conduct disorders, children with language disorders, um, and so forth. Uh, and also um, evidence from a recent Maudsley study um, that when uh, many of the individuals who do develop later mental health problems, these begin in their, their, their mid-teens. 
So the, the teenage years being at a time when there are other risk factors, other comorbidities coming in. And um, a couple of other studies, the um, Australian research so of um, consecutive referrals showing very high rates of psychopathology um, in children uh, with autism and nearly 10% uh, showing um, significant anxiety disorders um, and this other study by Leif et al um, showing around a quarter with mood disorders um, and a very substantial proportion with OCD although that's sometimes difficult to distinguish from uh, um, the ritualistic behaviours in autism obviously um, low rates of schizophrenia and that coming out in, in all the studies that are looking particularly at, at children who have got clear diagnoses of autism or Asperger's syndrome much less clear now in uh, groups of children with PDD NOS where um, they rates of schizophrenia uh, may be different. So clearly a group of children who need therapies to, to deal with their uh, social, emotional, mental health problems, but actually we, we haven't got many good therapies um, around. There's a few cognitive behaviour therapy studies, um, some single case studies or very small group studies, Baoming being the, the biggest group there, but very little in the way of comparative research uh, and even fewer randomised control trials. Um, there's uh, a recent one um, from, from Australia where they used a modified programme, um, a family-based programme for CBT, uh, developed for uh, typically developing children, um, and found that after 12 weeks in this programme, <coughs> uh, so quite significant changes in the, uh, in the treatment groups um, although this was mostly based on self-report or uh, parent and teacher's measures rather than uh, full diagnostic assessments and Kate Sofronoff as well a um, couple of Australian studies uh, showing um, significant improvements in uh, children uh, using uh, anxiety-based programs for CBT or a program for anger management. And that's using the sort of strategies developed really by, by Tony Atwood. The trouble is, of course, with um, cognitive behaviour therapy, uh, you can't just go out and use the, the sort of traditional types of approaches w without modification. Um, children with autism, or adults with autism, typically show a lack of awareness, both of their, the impact of their actions on self and, and other people. Um, motivation is different. These aren't people seeking therapy in their own right. They're usually pulled along by their mothers um, who, who no, recognise they're seriously um, depressed or very anxious. Um, but it's, it's uh, the, the fact that they're being brought along by somebody else uh, clearly has an impact on the uh, therapist-client relationship. Um, the cognitive um, diff differences that are typical of autism also affect the, uh, the whole structure of therapeutic uh, alliance. Um, and the communication problems as well. So here you've got a group of people who may um, sound as if they're using good language, but that um, is often quite stereotyped, doesn't really reflect people's true understanding. And it's very easy for therapists to be misled into thinking that the client has, has picked up the, um, the, the, the ideas about therapy, is responding well to therapy, whereas actually somebody with autism, a high-functioning person with autism, is just picking up on what the therapist says, so he picks up the, the sort of jargon, as it were, and repeats this back, so the therapist can think he or she has made a lot of progress, whereas in fact it's, it's more echolalia than anything else. Um, and the, um, their poor, um, their, their non-verbal skills can also be very uh, misleading. The literal understanding of language also has big problems. And just to give you an example of this, um, this was um, a child who was a teenager brought along by his mother who said he'd just developed um, um, a, a phobia of, of escalators in, in stores, wouldn't go to shops anymore because 
although previously he'd absolutely loved escalators, he'd now got this terrible fear of them. And uh, his mother wondered whether this was due to some sort of uh, traumatic event that he'd seen somebody fall on an escalator and his mother wondered whether this had triggered off the problem or whether there was other factors. But she, he'd been brought along, I think, quite rightly for sessions of cognitive behaviour therapy. Um, but actually, we couldn't quite understand why because he used to absolutely love escalators, particularly the shiny surfaces. Um, what had happened was that uh, in the store, they'd put up a notice saying, dogs must be carried at the bottom of the escalator and he had interpreted that as meaning if you go on the escalator you have to carry a dog so this very very literal interpretation and that was why he wouldn't go on the uh, the escalator he didn't need cognitive behavior therapy at all he just needed somebody to explain that what the meaning of this sign was. So one does need to work very carefully in analysing the basis of the problem uh, before ex uh, embarking on you know, long-term and much more expensive therapies. But also uh, other things that interfere, the difficulties of introspection, of expressing feeling. The, these are people who can't even express physical pain very um, uh, specifically in many instances, who may have really quite serious uh, problems, you know, broken limbs or abscesses or appendicitis, who cannot tell their parents where the physical pain is. So telling a therapist where the, where the emotional pain is is really very difficult. Um, and, of course, very unusual ways of uh, reporting um, anxiety and distress uh, and understanding other people. Um, and I think one has to bear in mind the you know, CBT, I'm, I'm sure can be important, but there's a whole range of experimental studies, really from the work of Amy Klin, you know, with toddlers onwards, showing these people, these are people who find difficulties in understanding social relationships from a very early age um, and how problems of mentalising, understanding social communication, all of these are going to interfere with more cognitive programmes. Um, I think the, uh, using visual strategies is helpful, uh, but even there, one, another problem is people's difficulties in, uh, in moderating their, their emotional responses. So often things like the uh, thermometers don't work very well because they're either down here or they're right up here and exploding and getting people to sort of rate their, their feelings can be very difficult. Um, so just in short, I think that um, cognitive behaviour therapy is important but you're going to need therapists um, who uh, understand. Sorry, the other going. Um, therapists who understand the whole nature of autism spectrum disorders, uh, particularly the, the difficulties with language. Um, so I, the style of language one needs to use um, is of necessity more concrete. The solutions need to be concrete and, as far as possible, very logical and rule-based. You need visual cues, um, much shorter sessions and much shorter uh, term goals as well. Also, you're not going to get generalisation unless parents are involved. So it can't just be a, a, a two-way therapist-client interaction. It needs to bring in more people. Um, and there also needs to be uh, a focus on just trying to improve social-emotional understanding more generally because without that, cognitive-based uh, therapies are unlikely to be helpful. So I think really we're talking about um, a small cognitive component there but probably more behavioural in many ways with a focus on trying to uh, improve emotional understanding. And there's a range of different... Uh, uh, programs that have been tried, all of which have positive effects, although, as I say, rather um, uh, circumscribed effects. So I think we need to be looking much more at what we can do for these individuals, but I, I think that probably in many ways it's going to be um, a focus on the behavioural um, as much, or at least as much as the cognitive, but a focus on the emotional as well. 
Um, but of course there's all sorts of other general approaches to the treatment of children with autism. Um, I think it's very important to um, look at what skills children have got and, in, and encourage the development of those uh, because sometimes, for example, early special interests particularly with the, the, uh, the internet now, that can become a source of, of uh, interaction with, with other people. Um, and sometimes even the strangest interests um, uh, enable people to um, feel part of the community. Uh, subsequently, um, one client I had who was interested in um, spiders and didn't, his parents weren't very pleased because his mother was uh, pretty phobic of spiders. But now he's a great expert on spiders and goes all around the world looking at different sorts of spiders and is in the on internet um, talking to other people about spiders. So he feels really part of the community. Uh, and this really does help to in, in improve um, you know, self-esteem. And clearly, if people are good at one thing, then you don't quite notice how you know, they may be a bit strange in other areas. Um, huge needs still for appropriate education, particularly within mainstream settings, where there's often real lack of understanding from teachers about the nature of um, autism spectrum disorders, and really the, the need for structure and predictability. And I think very important is this recognition that if problems start in early childhood, they're very likely to continue in later life unless their um, parents are given adequate help. So that a behaviour that's quite acceptable in a three-year-old may be very unacceptable in uh, somebody who's 20 years old or 30 years old. And just an example there, this was... Uh, um, a boy I knew who'd got a fascination with shoes, particularly with red shoes. And to keep him happy, his parents, they would go to jumble sales and they'd always buy, uh, if they saw a nice red shoe, they would give him a red shoe. So he had a big collection of red shoes and he was a very happy little boy with all his red shoes. The trouble is he's still very fascinated with red shoes and he's now um, over 20 years of age and if he sees somebody um, in the street or on the train wearing a bright red shoe, he will be there and he'll be um, feeling the shoe and touching the shoe and will start flapping and being very excited because he's seen a red shoe. And of course this is actually now very frightening to somebody who happens to be wearing a red shoe. Um, so a, a behaviour that was quite acceptable as a child no longer being acceptable and it's helping parents in a way I guess seeing to the future knowing what you should modify um, earlier on um, and then of course focus on really trying to um, improve social understanding particularly empathy uh, the way they change their own behaviour in social contexts and so forth and as I said, there's various techniques around, but all with fairly circumscribed effects. And I think we still, how we really have an impact on this area um, is still questionable. And I guess the, the um, final area that really requires a great deal more input is just support for families, particularly families of older children, because they see themselves as growing older, very concerned about what will happen if they are not around, so a lot more support needed there. So I think, you know, just looking over the last, uh, the last uh, century or so, we've certainly come a long way. So we're no longer using cattle prods for children whose behaviours we don't like or just pushing sweets down them um, if they do things we do like. But I think we've still got a long way to go and although we're moving into the range of so-called cognitive behaviour therapies, these are the Simon Baron Cohen's transporter type programmes, it's still pretty low level basic stuff um, and I think we've still got a long way to go. So I'll finish there but in, hopefully um, if people feel they'd um, like to look more at improvements in this area, hopefully the uh, uh, 
IMFAR meeting in London uh, next year will um, have some more interesting research findings. So I've been forced to uh, show, put those up by my colleague Tony Charman who's running the IMFAR meeting and if I can't swear I've brought lots of people in who's going to be uh, pretty mad. So, but I think it will be a very interesting meeting and we'll be addressing many of these issues. So thank you.